morning. Welcome to Grace Fellowship. We're so glad that you guys are here, whether you're here in person with us or you're online. We're so thankful you're here this morning. We are in the house of the Lord, so please. We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, we shout out your praise. Come on, y'all. We sing. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung upon that cross. Then he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Remember who you were, come on. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Cause we were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the Shout out your praise, there's joy. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, oh, oh. we shout out your praise. We shout out your shout amen we're in this place today because of what the Lord has done the work that has been done on the cross and in Christ's resurrection we live and we walk and we have our life and meaning not because of what we've done but because of what Jesus has done our boast is in him this morning all I have because of Jesus all this promise one for me and when he paid the highest ransom once for always for my freedom and I will boast in Christ alone yes his righteousness and not my
what can make us what can make me whole again nothing but nothing but the blood of Jesus come on let's sing that refrain together oh precious oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow Nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Can we give him praise this morning? Our boast is in Christ and in Christ alone. Amen. And I'm so thankful that the work of the cross, through him getting up from the grave, it doesn't stop the work that he's doing in us. Scripture says as we look to Jesus, the more we look to Jesus, the more... He makes us more like himself, taking us from one degree of glory to another. The Lord is in the business of refining us, shaping us, and molding us. And may that be our heart for him to have his way. Amen. If the altar's where you need us, take me there, take me there. What you need is just an offering. I'm right here, my life is here, and I'll be a living sacrifice for you. You're a fire, a refiner. I want to be cut I want to be dry. Purify, you take whatever you Is my life. I want to be tried. Purify me. You take, you take whatever you desire. Lord, He is my life. If your glory wants to come.
God praise this morning. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, worship team. Welcome to Grace Fellowship, a church for all nations. You know, we say that from time to time because that is our name, but we just want to celebrate this morning uh, specifically from what we know at this point. We have 68 first generation nations represented in our Grace family. And we praise the Lord for that. We have a map there uh, on the screen. And so maybe if you say, hey man, I'm, I'm from, you know, one of those areas that's not uh, yet uh, lit up. We'd love to know that. And uh, we're just so thankful to be able to do life and to do ministry here in this growing place called South Florida for the glory of God with brothers and sisters from various backgrounds. But you know, the beauty of the gospel is that we can all say that we have the same father. Amen? That God's brought us together so that we can have just that, that unity of saying, yes, yeah, that Jesus, yes. Like we have that same testimony of passing from death unto life because of his amazing grace in our lives. And if you've been here for any amount of time, you're like, Pastor Jeff, like I know which church I'm a part of. Like I know the name. Thank you for informing me again. Brothers and sisters, let us not get over how much of a blessing this is that God has brought us together to serve him together here in South Florida for his glory and, and our good. Well, we're going to do something a little bit different today. If you are new with us, we'd love to have a record of your attendance with us. We have a connect card there in the seat, but after I pray in just a few moments, we're going to leave the lights up a little bit so you'll actually be able to see where you're riding. All right, how about that? Little little try, uh, try this new uh, this morning. Then we're going to look at some announcements and then dive back into Romans chapter 5 and bring that to a conclusion this morning as God gives us the strength. And for our members and our regular attenders, thank you for being so faithful to give to the work of the Lord through our website, gograce.church, and our app, and also there in the lobby after the service. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word that is true, and your word is enough. And we pray, Father, as we, as we attempt to pull out from Romans chapter 5 what you have put there for us. God, just be gracious to us, we pray. Help us, help us to understand more about you. Help us to just have a greater level of joy and insight on how we can grow and press on and walk forward for you. In your name we pray, amen. Good morning and welcome to Grace. My name is Tony Sanchez and we're overjoyed that you're worshiping with us this Sunday. We all have that time when we're starting fresh, even at the end of the year. 
So for all new guests and longtime church members alike, we offer Starting Point as a first step for a new beginning. Learn about our foundational beliefs as I'll lead you towards a small group or service opportunity that's best for you. Our Starting Point class meets every Sunday at 10 a.m. in the lobby, but there'll also be a virtual Starting Point today on Zoom. To sign up, head over to our Next Steps tab on our website, gograce.church. This Wednesday, October 6th, we'll be taking a little break from our fall semester. All our classes, groups, Awana, and Grace students will not be meeting, but we eagerly await for all our groups to reconvene on Wednesday, October 13th at 6.30. Take this time to rest or spend time with your family and friends. Have you ever wanted to explore our Sunday experience in more depth? I encourage you to check out our devotional material. Our teaching pastor writes our devotionals based on our weekly sermons so that the entire family can learn and grow together. Here at Grace, we love to see people of all ages and all nations seek to grow in their knowledge and faith in the Lord. To find our devotional material, just scroll down on the main page of our website at gograce.church. Thanks again for worshiping with us today. Accessing sermon notes, giving online, and registering for events is easy. Just point your camera at the QR code on the back of the seat in front of you and click on the link that, you know what? Let me show you how that works. Come on over with me over here. Once you sit down, just have your phone out and swipe it open to your camera and you can hit the QR code or you can even take the card out to scan the QR code and click the link and it'll take you right to the site. It's that easy. Hang on tight as Pastor Jeff concludes our When in Rome 5 series. Have a great day, Grace. Good morning again, Grace. How are we? All right, let's take our Bibles, go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, we're going to be in verses 18 through 21 this morning, and uh, this is going to be our last message from Romans this year, and uh, we're going to take a break until uh, the following year, and for some of you guys say, man, that that seems to be too long, Um, the next year, 2022, is like less than just a couple of months away. Anybody surprised by that? Like, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not even going to comment on 2020, but 2021, my goodness, has been like so crazy level lightning fast. I don't even know what has happened uh, to this year. And so what we're going to do is next week, we're going to take four weeks and look at a series called Legacy of Grace. The first message is, to, is called Jesus Take the Bills. And so we're going to look at uh, whether we're struggling or whether we're doing well financially. How do we get some handles on uh, ways to improve our financial well-being for the glory of God? How are we supposed to even think about possessions and money and work in general? Because for many of us, those are sort of things that we just sort of do, right? Often we don't sit and think about, okay, what thoughts does God have about uh, these topics and these areas? So we hope this is going to be informative and helpful to you. We're going to have a lot of fun. And then we're going to take uh, four weeks and go through the book of Ruth from the Old Testament and to see God's grace through that. And then by that time, we're going to be like in the month of December. How crazy is that? And we're going to be in uh, Christmas at Grace. So just to give you a little road map uh, for how we round out 2021. Now, before we read these several verses, I want to just say that if you've been with us for any amount of time in Romans 5, man, this is heavy lifting. How many of you guys have experienced that? Like in Romans 5? All right, awesome, seven of you. That's, that's so great. And so, like, if you, if you start reading Romans 5, you find out really quick, man, you are in a, like, like a subterranean cavern of theology and this web that goes back to the Old Testament, that goes to what's going to happen and God's plan for the future. And then sometimes the Apostle Paul, like you even see in your translation there of, of God's Word, There's a dash, and then he begins building like this footnote, which is sort of an adjacent thought that supports his main idea. And if you have felt lost, like not lose your salvation because we can't lose that. Amen? I want to clarify that. All right? I don't want to be clipped and put on YouTube just that, right? And and you're like, I I, I don't know. Like, I'm not exactly sure how to track with Paul. This is confusing. Welcome to the club. All right? Romans chapter 5 is intense, it is dense material, 
And here's what, here's what can happen, at least for the general American church. And I know we're a church of all nations, but generally in the American church, we don't go through Romans chapter 5, verse by verse. Let me just put that out there, all right? You guys all right? Like, we just don't do that. It's too laborious, it's too intense, it's too weighty, because where we naturally, where we naturally flock to is areas of God's Word that are immediately accessible, like the stuff that you read it, and you're like, yes, I can put that on the back of a coffee cup. That is, so, yes, that's amazing. It feels good, sounds good. Like, yeah, I, I can run with that. Like, I don't need to do any deep dive. I don't need to do any study. The, all of God's word is truth from him. But I truly believe that God knows what's going to happen in our life, and we don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. You tracking with me so far? And sometimes it can be easy to push back on parts of the Bible that don't seem to be like immediately applicable to our life. You know what I'm talking about? And there's sometimes you read God's word, you're like, man, I, I know that's in, in the word of God. I believe scripture is true and authoritative in all matters of faith and doctrine. But Lord, I don't exactly know what to do with this in my life right now. That's because what God is doing, don't miss this is he is building up the materials in your soul. He is building up the storehouse of truth that you may not need until six years from now. Our natural tendency and the natural drift of the American church is to go towards what sounds good, what feels good, what's super easy to understand. God actually gave Romans 5 because what he wants to do is build up the foundation of our soul so that when we are tempted by false doctrine, so that when we have a conversation with a friend or a loved one who is confused, when we talk to someone who is very self-righteous because they're a religious person, that's where Romans 5 can come into play. So again, if you get stuck in an aspect of God's Word, or even here, if it seems to be intense and dense, know that that is God's gracious, loving kindness to drop some things in your backpack as you press on for him that you may not need for years. And we'll say this. Please don't take it offensively. Children only think about right now. Children only think about right now. When we grow in maturity, our eyes become lifted to what God is going to do, not just in our life in the future, but in the world in the generations to come. So I want to challenge you as we march through this, as we continue to just preach and teach the Word of God, if there's some stuff that seems to be confusing, you are not alone. If there's some stuff that doesn't seem to be immediately right there, it's application, I can run with it, that's because God is building up our strength and he's growing us to maturity. And I don't know of any good coach, I don't know of any trainer that has someone to train and never makes them actually work out. Like, like who are the high dollar trainers? They're the ones that can bark at you and sometimes use King James English, right? And they're just like all over your case, but they're able to encourage you, confront you, put some more weight on the bar because that's the only way you're going to make progress. Nobody wants to waste time with a trainer that never actually trains. Nobody wants to play for a team whose coach is so soft that the coach never says, give me 40. Let's run again. And by the way, I'm not talking about I'm being the coach. I'm not the, I'm not the trainer. That's the Holy Spirit from the word of God. If we actually allow him to speak to us through his word and not run from what seems to be the hard stuff, it's through those sections and chapters and books in the Bible we actually grow. So that's the introduction. You guys ready? All right, we're going to wrap this up with therefore righteousness. In Romans chapter 5, we have a number of therefores. And today we're going to see how grace abounds through God's righteousness. Now, a quick word of context here. The context is the Apostle Paul is trying to wrap up this argument to combat um, a, a, a tendency 
of his fellow Jewish believers to consider themselves uh, more than or better than the Gentiles. And this is a constant chronic problem in the New Testament. And the Apostle Paul, being a Hebrew of Hebrews, being an all-star Pharisee, being a Jew of all Jews, is bringing everyone together on the same page so that we can all see that Jesus Christ is an equal opportunity Savior. And the way he does this is by giving four different contrasts here. And so first, we see, and we're going to read this in a moment, verse 18, the contrast is this. One trespass that brought all people under condemnation. That was the trespass, the sin of Adam. But then on the flip side, you have one act of righteousness, thereby all can have life and justification. Notice verse 18. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. So if you want to dive into a book on doctrine or theology, this is where you will see mentioned what's called the federal headship of Adam. Now, that's not talking about the federal government has nothing to do with taxes, all right? Nothing to do with Congress. But that Adam, uh, being the federal head of the human race, in a sense, all of the human race that is, was in a sense in Adam then. And so Adam's sin bled into all of his physical descendants. But those who are born again in Christ receive what Christ has done. So you have this this juxtaposition here. You have the, the condemnation from Adam that we are all under, and then you have the justification and then the life, and the life that actually come through Jesus. It's fascinating. In the original language, this word for life is not just bios or bios, not just biological life. It's not talking about people who are just simply breathing, but it's the word zoe, Z-O-E. And we may even have some zoes online or here in the house. And that is the word for actual life. The word that, that has the concept of eternal life. And I've known a lot of people who are alive but are not really alive. Do you realize that you can, you can be debt-free? Man, you, you can look good, you can smell good. You can be popular, you can have incredibly good health, you can have like a resting heart rate of 22, like you could run, like you, you go to any CrossFit gym and kill it, Navy SEAL workout, you got it, you got like a 16 pack going on, like tiny percent body fat, you could be the stuff, but according to scripture, according to scripture, this is a far reaching claim, you are actually not fully alive. You are simply breathing, and every success that you gain is ultimately leading to nothing, an absolute loss. Man, that's a huge claim. Like, even people that are, you know, nice or, or religious or they're, they give a lot of money to noble causes or they're, you know, save the whales, save the dogs, save the cats, what I like, people who just do stuff, people that are good-hearted, people who help out their neighbors, people who will help a widow or an orphan in trouble and just try to be out of the goodness of their own heart, a nice person. According to Scripture, if you don't have Christ, you are not actually spiritually alive. And again, that even some of the best things that we do can be, in a sense, for the feeling and the high of knowing I just did something good. And if you guys would just be like me, the world would be in a better place. Isn't it crazy the deceptiveness of our own hearts that sometimes even the good things that we know we should do, that we even do, if Christ is not the one moving that forward and Christ is not in that, we can come away more arrogant than before we even gave the gift? But the scripture here says that through Christ, this one act, and that's a fascinating many phrase here in verse 18. So one act of righteousness, what Jesus has done, leads to justification, which means that we're justified, we're right before God. We can have confidence, humble confidence that he wants a relationship with us and life for all men. Now, what one act was it? Because I know we have a lot of thinkers at Grace Fellowship. Like, okay, well, it says one act. You know, was it, was it calming the storm? Was it, was it healing people? Was it laying, 
was it laying the smacketh down on the Pharisees and like this logical, you know, blitzkrieg on in just showing that they are full of things other than God. Let me just leave that right there and how Jesus is the way, the truth, and life. Well, what exactly was it when it speaks of the one act? Well, when we look at the life of Christ and how he fulfilled all of the prophecies for being the Messiah, Jesus' life, this is the only person that we can say this about, was one, his entire life, was one genuine, seamless, perfect act. And by act, we don't mean acting like something that he's not. Praise God, Jesus is consistent entirely. So Jesus living his consistent life with who he actually is, is perfection and beauty and kindness and compassion. But we think about I don't know if you've ever gotten just drawn into a particular movie or a particular show. Isn't that terrible? If you're like, I have things to do, but I can't turn it off. Right? I can't wait to see what happens in the next scene. And like, well, let me just finish this episode. And you finish the episode and you're like, I must have more, right? And you're like, oh, I'm failing life. And you know, and sometimes you just we just get hooked into that. Because we see the incredible bravery or brilliance or sometimes, whoa, I, I'm glad I'm not that person of the hero or the heroine. But then you have the realist in your family who says, like tap you on the shoulder like, hey, that's just a movie. They're like, let me enjoy it for a moment, if you will. That's not real. He's acting a part. She can't actually do that. Like that, that's all fake. Now, I know we, we may have a 40 something male here who's holding on to the fact that professional wrestling is still real, right? Put your faith in Christ, brother. Put your faith in Christ so that one day when the light comes on, your life will not be crushed. But when we think of someone acting a part, just acting a part, like somebody can act heroic but they're not actually in combat. Someone can take that leap to save the little boy or little girl from the train, but that's all CGI. With Jesus, we can look at what pure consistency actually is. You know what's awesome about the Christian life is how God's graciousness is revealed to us and constantly helping us see that we need him. The way that we usually see and are reminded that we need him more and more is when we are confronted with our own inconsistency. If you need consistency, if you need consistency in your soul and your life, if you need something that's stable, look to Jesus Christ. Amen? So let's contrast number one. Number two is where one man's disobedience results in many were made sinners. On the other side, we see that one man's obedience results in that many will be made righteous. The greater question here, beyond any question of, of whose guilt is attributed to whom, the greatest question in Romans chapter 5 is how in the world would I ever be able to receive Jesus' gift of eternal life and forgiveness? What about me makes it possible for him to give me what I could never be and never earn? I talk to so many people, and the conversation is like, man, I, like, I get that, and that'd be amazing to you know, have eternal life or to have that confidence and have a meaningful life to know that my suffering is not in vain, my work is not in vain, and my life is going to count towards something greater than myself. But be honest, Jeff, I don't know if I could do that. Like, I think I may mess it up, bro. Like, if I become a follower of Jesus, like, actually commit my life to him, I don't think I have what it takes. So I'm just going to stay here instead of step forward. If that's where you are, good job. That's the point of the gospel. The point of the gospel is that we realize that we can't do it. We can't. And that's where amazing grace becomes Amazing. Notice verse 19. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, 
so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. So this is a remaking of a mold. The point here is that we are all, regardless of when we were born or where we were born, are made in the mold of our father, Adam. It means that all of us have the natural propensity and desire and tendency to justify ourselves, to be selfish, to lie, to cheat, to steal, and yes, even to kill. Human nature. We've said this more times than we can remember, but that's the reason why we don't have to teach our children to misbehave. Because they are our children, and we are our parents' children. And it goes back and back and back to our mold reflects sin. But the beauty of the gospel is that we are being remade into a new mold after the reflection and the image of Jesus Christ. Now, what's fascinating here um, is that the future tense is used in the latter phrase. Notice he says, the many will be made righteous. So what is the Apostle Paul getting to here? He's leading us to think about what God will do in the future. Now go with me here for a moment. The natural default of the human mind is to think about self. True or not true? To think, how does this benefit me? Another term I want to throw out, if you're looking to, to dive deep uh, in some, some Christian books, would be the phrase, the noetic effects of sin. Nous in Greek is the word for mind. And this is something I'm thinking more and more and more on, is what effect does being born as a sinner, with a sin nature, living in a sin-filled world, have on how we actually think? Most people including myself. Guys, the way that we naturally come out of our mother's womb is we think about ourselves. Like we have a five-month-old. It has not happened yet to where he, he has said, wah, wah, mom, how tired are you? I'm going to take, take this one for the team. I know you guys are probably, your caffeine level is like, whoo, a little bit too high. Thank you so much for all that you do for me. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to try to man up or baby up on this one because I want you to be able to have one night where you're going to get a full night's sleep. Hasn't happened yet. We still tracking? Baby cries because the baby has needs. I've known some adults where that's not really changed. Can we do this? We're about to. Have you ever been in a conversation with a person and you know that the only thing that will free you is Jesus' second coming? <laughs> you ask them the question, how are you? And 45 minutes late, you are still doing time. Right, Pastor Jeff, that, that sounds mean. No, follow me here. Ask yourself the question, has the person asked about anybody else in this entire 45-minute conversation? Who have they talked about themselves? Have they responded with a question, how about you? Most People without Christ do not mature. Some of us, we've read leadership books, and it says to make good business deals, close your mouth and ask good questions. But still, there is the drive to be about and talk about self. Why is that? That's part of the effects of the, that, that's, that's one aspect, one angle of the noetic effects of sin that even our thinking is turned inward. The way that you can tell that a man or a woman, a student, is actually maturing to be more like Jesus rather than our father Adam is if in our conversations we pursue trying to care and learn about others and not just tell everyone about ourselves. The natural human mind says the way that I get happiness is I get all of my needs met. I get enough respect. 
I get enough affirmation, I get enough accolades, and if I can get all that, if my wife, my husband, my boyfriend, girlfriend, if my work, if my team, my coach, if they can give me enough attention and give me what I need, then I will be happy. Jesus disagrees. He said, if you try to save your life, you lose it. If you lose your life for my sake in the gospel, you will find it. What Jesus is doing is confronting Jeff Robinson and every single one of us in here and online that the natural drive is for us to talk about ourselves, to do that which is beneficial for ourselves. But the gospel of Jesus says, look to me and what do you see? Radical sacrifice on the cross for his enemies. The way that you can tell a person's maturity and drive and focus is what bothers them. Questions like, how do I get my non-Christian friends introduced to Jesus Christ? Bothers me that I have so many friends and colleagues and coworkers that are not Christians, and I want them to be. And, and I'm trying to find out how I can help them know who Jesus is. Questions such as, how do we get the gospel more effectively to unreached or unengaged people groups? That's a measure of maturity. And we're so thankful to be a part of Grace Fellowship, a church for all nations, to where we are seeing men and women and students place their faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. And be baptized. What, what a marvelous, awesome thing that is. But I'll be very honest with you. Here at Grace and combined with the other churches in Palm Beach County who are seeking to teach the gospel and not compromise on the message of the truth, we are not turning back the needle of lostness. More people are moving into our area, more and more and more, and the vast majority from any type of study that we find do not have life in Christ. But I happen to know of a church that God's placed on Okeechobee Boulevard with 60,000 plus cars going by a day. That's why we hammer it week in and week out to keep his main thing as our main thing. For us to see people come to Christ and then teach them the word of God. And questions like, man, how do we, since the Apostle Paul is talking about those who will be saved, he's thinking multi-generationally. The Apostle Paul is not just thinking about his own life or his own well-being or his own retirement. He's saying, praise God for what God will do in the future. The way you see a measure of maturity, one mark, from a young person is the absence of, boy, all these old people today. One of the marks of maturity from an older person is you, it, it, it will be absent or rare. All these millennials these Gen Z, these Gen Ys, next, the new generation's messing everything up. May it be, brothers and sisters, that we step back and let Romans 5 speak, that all of us are under sin, we all need one another to advance the message of the gospel, so for Gen Z and Y and millennials to pray for boomers and builders, and boomers and builders begin to build and strategize so that the next generations can come to faith in Jesus Christ. That's what gets us out of our own stuff. But if we're not walking in maturity, no matter if you're 22 or 92, you will grow more and more and more crusty, angry, and at the end, you'll just be screaming in a, in a room by yourself at the world instead of trying to reach the world with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. And I can talk about senior citizens now. I'm 41. Let's go. <laughs> you want to see one of the most incredible TED Talks in the Bible. We don't have time for this this morning. But Joshua 24, Joshua lines everybody up, and he challenges them with this in verse 14. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in, Ju and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Oh, my goodness. If we had time to go through that this morning, what he's doing is he's challenging the entire nation to say where God wants to take us is going to require thinking different than all of our family and our fathers in the past. And we're so thankful for our families. Amen? 
and our parents to try to do the best they could. Some of us have godly parents. Some of us have parents. They just, they just didn't know. And I'm asking the Lord to help me to speak into their life or remember their memory with honor and care. But brothers and sisters, the call of Christ is to say, yes, we give honor to whom honor is due. But if God says go, we go. If God says pursue him, we pursue him above everything else. Christ over all. Not Christ according to what I've always been comfortable with. And when you see that willingness to pursue, no matter the cost, you will see an explosion of maturity in the life of a man, a woman, and a student, and you will also see an exponential increase in their joy. You guys all right? We just took like eight minutes and literally offended everybody of every age, right? Okay, welcome to Grace. Glad you're here. Um, number three, contrast number three, God's law. I hope that this is helpful, especially if you're new to the Bible. What it did in the intent was to intensify the severity of sin. Robert Mounts, the great New Testament scholar, said it this way, the law was never intended to provide salvation, but to convince people of their need for it. Now, this is a, an incredible wormhole deep dive, but let me just say this, that in the time of Jesus and the Apostle Paul, in the Jewish community at large, as we see reflected in the lives of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and we've said this more times than we can remember, the reason why the, uh, the, the Sadducees, they didn't believe in the resurrection, which was the reason why they are sad, you see, right? <laughs> Is they had twisted the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, to say God gave it to us so that we can get to him. The Apostle Paul is saying, no, no, God gave us the Old Testament. He gave us the Torah. He gave us the prophets and the law to create in us an understanding that we need a Savior. So the law, if you want to write this down as well, Galatians chapter 3 and verses 19 through 22, it speaks of verse 22, the Scripture, the Old Testament, imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise of faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. So the point is that the, the Old Testament was sort of like a magnifying glass to our sin. It helped us understand how great our sin was in scope and in depth to the fact that every single person born of Adam, that's every single ethnicity, every single culture, all, we all together need a Savior. And let me just mention as well, Romans chapter 5 is so relevant today because people who want to drive us into our respective camps of ethnicity and culture, or some people use the term race, Romans chapter 5 brings us all together. We're all together because we all need a Savior. And the law acts, in a sense, for those of you that enjoy having a clean house, go with me here. You try to clean the room, you dust the room, you just a lightly, light moisture on that, that rag, and you get all of the dust, right? All of the dust off of everything. And you say, you know what? It's a beautiful day. It's now fall and so flow. Let me pull back the drapes, and all of a sudden the sunlight comes in, and guess what you see more of? <laughs> dust. I know some of you right now are just, you know, you're just twitching, like, ah, oh, don't tell me, tell me, right? And we think, man, we got it all. But then the sunlight comes in. And by the way, for those of us that enjoy having everything just perfectly clean, let me just help you. Can your pastor help you for just a moment? Can I help your family and your spouse and your neighbors and everybody that you've ever known? You'll never be able to clean it all perfectly. <laughs> just have a moment together. Just have a moment. Say, but one day you say, in heaven, Jesus is going to have everything clean. Maybe you just talk to him. He'll, he'll work all that out. But when the light comes in, you realize what you didn't see when the light was not there. Notice God's law, the purpose was to intensify the severity of sin. But then God's grace in verse 20 superabounded even more. Verse 20, now the law came in to increase the trespass where sin increased, but then grace abounded all the more. Grace overflowed. Here's the idea that it was 
far more. You, you take all of the condemnation and the sin that came from Adam, and then the beauty of God's grace, his power through his grace is sort of like a kid's play car next to a full-size SUV, or take, you know, the little peewee um, football player next to an NFL lineman from a team that actually wins a lot of football games, which is not my team. You take a toy fighter jet and compare that to a real F-35, you see that God's grace is more than enough for our sin. And then finally, contrast number four, we see that sin reigned in death, but grace reigns through righteousness, verse 21, so that... As sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The point here is God's grace is there so that grace would be king of our life. Amen? Is God's grace reigning and acting as king in your life at this stage? Brothers and sisters, I think one of the greatest things that we can do in this season of our lives as individuals and as a church is to ramp up our outreach. We mentioned that briefly last week. We've got a number of these invite cards, and I'd encourage you to grab some and carry them with you this week and give them out. I was able to give one out a couple of days ago. Praise Jesus to the, uh, the person there at Taco Bell. Three hard tacos and one beef chalupa. Can I get a witness in the house? And then you go home and you do penance with what's called a salad, right? You know what I'm talking about? And, you just, and, and I was able to just get that and invite that, that person to church. And there's different ways that you can take this to Walmart. Just, I mean, if you can't sleep and it's 2 a.m., go to Walmart, hand some out. There's ways that you can share grace online. Guys, what I'm saying is I think from 2020 all the way through this year, it's so easy for all of us just to be sunk in a specific way of thinking. What I'm suggesting that we start asking the Lord to do is to help us be thinking in a reach-out mindset. The great pastor Warren Wiersbe gave a beautiful contrast between Adam and Jesus, and here's what he says. Adam came from the earth, but Jesus is the Lord from heaven. Adam was tested in a garden, this is fascinating, surrounded by beauty and love, but Jesus was tempted in a wilderness and died on a cruel cross surrounded by hatred and ugliness. Adam was a thief and cast out of paradise, but Jesus on the cross turned to a thief and said, today you will be with me in paradise. And this one blew my mind. At the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible is the book of the generations of Adam, and it ends with a curse in Malachi chapter 4, verse 6, if you want to go check that out. But the New Testament is the book of the generations of Jesus Christ that ends in Revelation chapter 22, praise be to God, where there is no more curse. And what a blessing it is to be a part of an all-nations church in 2021 for the glory of God. If we keep his main thing as our main thing, brothers and sisters, we ramp up our outreach to the glory of God. And some of us, for the first time, maybe even today, actually believe God that he's telling the truth, that his grace is enough for you. You could become brand new today. I think some of us, the, the hard things to understand, and Pastor Lowe, you can come on up, prepare for our time of communion. The hardest things for some of us to understand is not the ontological argument for the existence of God. For some of us, it's not understanding the, the manuscripts of the Bible. For many of us, the hardest thing, the thing that's kept us from embracing Jesus is not believing him that his grace is actually enough for us. We cannot conceive of the fact that he could actually know us and actually love us. Like, we, 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 we've just not been able to go there emotionally, mentally. It may be that this morning, for the first time in your life, you see that that is, that's essentially unbelief, where Jesus is saying, follow me, believe me, my grace superabounds even more. Would you be willing to trust him? I pray that you would. 
For those of us that are followers of Christ, we're going to partake in communion together as a family, and I would ask that you take your communion elements and uh, take off the tab with the bread first. And uh, if you choose to ignore that advice, you will find out why it was given in just a moment. And as Pastor Lowe sings a song over us, I would just encourage you to take just a, a quiet moment to ask the Lord, say, Lord, would you search me? Would you know me? If he brings something to your mind, an attitude, a thought, maybe a pattern that you're stuck in, confess that to say the same thing that he says about it. Repent of it and experience his grace and forgiveness. Pastor Lowe. Just prior to the crucifixion, Jesus met with his disciples to share in the Passover meal. Then he took the bread, he gave thanks for it, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body that has been broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then Jesus took the cup and he told them that he would not drink from it again until his kingdom comes. Then he told them that this cup is poured out for you, and it is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Aren't you thankful for the Lord Jesus? I'm so thankful for his grace, his mercy, his love, his power, the staying power of the gospel in our lives. And before uh, we go, I'm going to have a word of prayer here in just a moment. Uh, we would love to have a, a record of your time with us. If you're a new guest, you haven't had a chance to fill out the Connect card, the lights are still on so you can actually see what you're writing on. But maybe if, if God has been speaking to your heart and, and that's been a big deal for you, that's been a mountain that you've not yet been able to climb to actually believe that his grace is enough for you, that he can and desires to, to forgive you, to cleanse you and and use you for great things in the future. And this may be a moment that God has brought you to so you can actually become a genuine, actual, committed Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ. Because if Jesus actually did what Scripture says that he did, and even the enemy sources say that Jesus died on the cross, what about my sin is stronger than him? I mean, is it actually, I'm too much for Jesus to handle? That's really what some of us need to wrestle with. We all understand our own sin, amen? We all have some level of guilt and shame, but it, is he not strong enough for that? What, what, what about my past? Is he the one, the Lord over all, not able to handle? So if that's been a stopping point for you as Jesus has graciously led you to this place, online or here in this room, I would encourage you to, to just walk through that in your mind and come to the place, I pray that you come to the place, to where you see, Jesus, your grace superabounds. I believe more in your power 
than in the power of my past. If you come to that place and you receive him, you will experience the greatest reality that ever has been and ever will be, and that is our hearts, our minds are being transformed, being transformed by his power and his saving grace. Let's stand. Father, we thank you for Romans. Romans chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. God, bring us back next week, we pray, as we uh, ask you to take the bills and, and look at different handles that you give us in your word on how we can uh, maximize our finances and in ways that we can uh, come out from under what for some of us is just an oppressive uh, level of stress and anxiety because we believe that you have great plans for us for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And the Lord bless you. We love you.